My wife and I were driving home from Denver, Colorado to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and stopped at a gas station in Las Vegas, New Mexico. I believe it was Phillips 66 at approximately 100 on 10-18-2013. We pulled off of I-25 southbound into the gas station parking lot. When we were driving down from the frontage road towards the gas station, we saw a few vehicles on the far end of the parking lot with three to four people talking and a New Mexico state police officer cruiser was leaving the lot. However, upon parking in front of the gas station, we discovered that it was closed. I needed to pee rather urgently, so I ran around to the back of the station to find a dark place to do my business. I walked about 20 meters behind the gas station to be totally out of sight of the occupied vehicles in the gas station lot. As I was urinating, I began to feel uncomfortable. I was peeing in open ground and initially thought somebody was walking up behind me, probably to do the same thing. I craned to look around and saw nobody, no animals, just a blanket feeling that somebody was very near me. As I finished peeing, I turned and began briskly walking back towards our vehicle. As I was hurrying back, I turned to look behind me, and this is when I became a believer. Before I continue, I would like to preface that my anecdote by alluding to my high level of academic credentials alongside my occupation as a healthcare executive. I also provide executive and technical advice to elected and appointed officials. I have worked very hard to become an expert based on empirical analysis and studied fact. I did not believe in Bigfoot, ghosts, or another unexplained anomalies. I believed in results, hard work, and well results. My perspective is now very different. As I turned and looked over my left shoulder, I saw an enormous lurking animal. The animal was crouched over almost as if taking cover in the sparse and cold vegetation. In fact, I think the creature watched me the whole time and did not make such a noise. However, the creature noticed when I saw it. It stood up and quickly lumbered into the dark away from the direction of the parking lot. The one attribute of the creature that resounded with me was how heavy the footfall was. It sounded like somebody dropping a sack of potatoes over and over again, and it was fast. I observed the creature for about 11 seconds from the moment I realized I saw it to watching the animal dart into the wood line. Due to the radiant light from the parking lot, I could make steady detail of the fleeing creature. Here are the salient points from my memory, aside from the footfall. The creature was approximately 8 to 10 feet tall. I'm 6'2", and this animal would have towered over me, since I observed it on flat land leading to my estimation. The hair on the creature was matted, like dogs that live outside. The coloration was dark brown. The creature had a very defined gait. It took strides that I would estimate to be three to fourths of my stride per one of its strides. It had massive human-like hands. The creature was very skittish not moving until realizing I was observing it, lending to a higher intellect than that of a brown bear. I believe the creature may have fled in fear. I did not make eye contact, but noticed a massive brown and defined jaw and cranial structure. There is one other trait that I have since read about that may allude to this being a New Mexico Bigfoot. The air was rank with what I thought was the dumpster behind the gas station. However, this might be the musk eyewitnesses have reported in the past. I cannot be sure, but it was very powerful, and somewhat reminiscent of what I perceived to be urine. This incident was fearful and moving. I was unable to sleep for days and could not bring myself to tell my wife, until recently. Due to my profession and reputation, I have extreme, extreme reluctance about openly sharing my encounter. However. I have personal visual evidence of a so-called mythical beast, and I do not know what to do with it. Another fact, I have a concealed carry handgun license in the state of New Mexico, and was carrying a 1911 45 at the time of the incident. 
I was so scared that reaching for my weapon would not have been an afterthought. I was actually scared stiff. I also noticed that the animal was trying to stay hidden and very cognizant of what I was and when I noticed it. It was Saturday, July 16th, 2011, about 12.30 a.m., early last Saturday morning. We were going to the Cheska Mountains on the Navajo Reservation for a family reunion. We just left the main paved highway through Narbana Pass, Indian Service Route 32, Highway 134, between Sheep Springs, New Mexico and Crystal, New Mexico. We went south on a dirt road Indian Service Route 32 into the Cheska Mountains. We were about five to eight miles into the mountains when we came upon a small hill that curved towards the east, then to the south. As we approached the hill to go up, the road quickly turned right or south. As we reached the top, we saw the full moon and it lit up a flat green pasture that was on top of the hill. And as soon as we made the turn to the right, I noticed a big black figure standing there. As I looked at it, it stood with the full moon behind it, so that all I could see was a black outlined form. I kept my eyes on the figure while making the turn right. I said to my wife, did you see that? And she said, what? I said, something is standing over there by the road. As I looked, I noticed that the figure was standing by a small pond, which was about 10 to 15 feet from the road. I could see the figure's reflection in the pond, along with the full moon. I would say when I first saw it, it was about 75 feet away. As we got closer, our headlights turned to the right, away from the black figure. But I still could see it, because the moonlight was so bright. It just stood there, still, as if it was waiting for us to leave. I told her I was going to pull the truck onto the edge of the road the road being dirt, and because of the rain, it had been plowed, so there was a ridge of dirt on both sides of the road. So I pulled the vehicle left towards the Bigfoot to flash my headlights on it. As my headlights flashed the Bigfoot, it turned. We could see the legs, which there were two of them, turn, and the arms, again, two of them turn, and it started running away from us up a small hill into the trees. It was a quick, smooth run. I mentioned to her that it ran ninja-like, smooth and stealthy. In less than six seconds, it was in the trees. As it was turning and running, we didn't see any clothing, buttons shining from the headlights or moonlights. We just saw a huge mass, a body running on two legs, and we never saw any eyes. We noticed the legs and arms, and for sure, it ran on two legs up the hill. We were about 30 feet away from it when it ran up the hill. We could see that it was not a bear, nor a human. It stood at least 7 to 8 feet tall. It was wider and taller than a person. After it ran away, we were in shock. We sat quietly in the truck, still for about 15 seconds. Then all of a sudden, my oldest daughter screamed and said, Daddy, what was that? I was shocked that she was awakened the whole time. I thought only my wife and I saw it, but she was terrified, asking me over and over. I couldn't say anything but tell her that it was a Bigfoot. My wife and I aren't crazy, nor are we believers of Bigfoot, until now. In fact, we were the biggest skeptics there are, but we can't deny what we saw. I have to believe it because it was real. My wife also admitted that she saw it too as we first approached the hill, just like I did. She just wasn't sure at the time if it was the same thing that I saw. It was eerie and exciting at the same time. We also went back there on Sunday to look for tracks. There weren't any. The ground was extremely hard where it ran up the hill. Along the pond, we saw hoof prints from cows, dog prints, deer prints, but no noticeable Bigfoot prints of any kind. By the way, the pond was only about 10 to 15 feet wide. It was just runoff of rainwater, so it isn't always there during the year. It seemed to me that it was not wanting to be seen. I believe if I did not turn my headlights towards him, 
it would have probably stood there until we passed by. Then it would have left. I think it was very intelligent, because it watched us. And even before I can get the headlights turned on to him, he had already started to turn away from us. It had to have known what we were going to do next. That is probably why we didn't see any eyes. I have lots of stories from my grandmother about Bigfoot. She said they have been here since the beginning of time, and that they were like us, living among us, until they saw humans start to fight amongst themselves. Then, they didn't want any part of us anymore, so they went into hiding. They know that if they kill a human or make contact with one, they know that nothing good will come out of it. So, that is why they stay in hiding. After our encounter, we heard a lot more people have witnessed Bigfoot in this same area. We also observed that the Bigfoot noticed us on the hill. It seemed to me that it stood there until it noticed we were turning towards it, because it was already turning before our headlights shined on it. That is why we didn't see any eyes or any face. I've also heard other stories. Many more sightings have happened because of the fires in the Arizona mountains. I even talked to a Navajo Nation Ranger once, and he stated that a lot more deer, elk, and other animals have also migrated into the Cheska Mountains because of the fires. A friend was visiting from out of town, and so we decided to take advantage of the clear skies and mild temperatures and go for a road trip. We had just been down near Window Rock, Arizona, and were heading back to Farmington, New Mexico. The easiest way to do so is going over a certain pass nearby. The speed limit on the road is 65 miles an hour, and I was traveling at 65 when coming around a corner just south of the picnic area. There is only one area that is located east, just off the highway. As I came around the corner, I noticed something moving rapidly in a diagonal direction up the side of the hill, just where the forest meets the meadows lining either side of the highway. It would be the east side of the road. I slowed down and said to my friend, Did you see that? He had seen it as well. I hit the brake to get another look, but knew that by that time, I backed it up, and whatever it was would have been long gone. What we saw was larger than a black bear or an elk. Blackish brown hair that could have been seen hanging from all over its body. It was running on two legs up the hill. It never looked over at us, and we only saw its backside. Broad and at least seven feet tall. We were both under the impression that we had startled it, and it was quickly trying to get into the forest for cover. We stopped a mile or two up the road, where the road crosses this creek at an ancient lava flow. The whole time we were looking out at the rocks, there was an eerie feeling that we were both getting, that something was watching us. We stayed around for an hour, when the sun started to get lower behind the mountains, and we decided that it was best to leave. Late in the afternoon, early fall, getting ready to move our livestock back down from the mountain to the winter camp. My brother and I with our mother were looking for our cattle. Mom had cook, and we ate lunch, got some rest, and talked about what areas we haven't checked yet. My brother was still eating, so my mom and I decided to check the area below our summer sheep camp. We got in my truck and started driving slowly. We had driven about a mile or two from the house, down the mountainside, thick brushes and pine trees, driving slow enough to look around for any cows that were down that way. Usually, there are some, but today, there weren't any to be found. So, we kept driving, Mom talking about how the weather was changing and getting a bit chilly. I kept looking left and to the right, driving slowly. Then, I saw movement just behind the pine trees. First, I thought it was a man, so I stopped and backed up for just a bit and said to mom, who's that? And she goes, where? I said right there, look, and pointed for her in that direction. That person was standing right next to a pine tree, tall reddish brown. The person went behind a tree and stood there. So I backed up some more and then that person turned and started moving fast away from us into the thick brush. That's when mom and I both noticed that this person 
had long hairy arms because when it turned around, the arms span around. It was reddish brown. It ran into the woods. We were still parked there, puzzled. Mom goes, what was that? And I told her I didn't know. Then I got scared and looked at my mom and said, let's go. We turned right there on the road and headed for home. We drove back fast and believe me, this particular road requires slow driving, but not that afternoon. We got back to the house and told my brother. He goes, it's probably a sheep herder. I told him a sheep herder wouldn't have gone and had long hairy arms. Then he tells me that no they wouldn't. He wanted to go back down there and look for that person, but I was scared and the sun was about to go down behind the mountain. It would be dark soon. I'm going down there that evening, no way. We packed up our stuff and left from the mountain. At approximately 8.30 p.m., I was on my back way from dinner with my grandfather near Shiprock, New Mexico. While sitting on the passenger side of my mother's truck, I was looking out the window. On State Highway near Crystal, New Mexico, before Bull Canyon turnoff, at that moment, I was feeling calm, bored, and frustrated with trying to calm my younger cousin, who was very hyper. So, while I was looking for something to amuse him, I sighted something unusual moving. It was huge. It was as tall as the cedar trees that are around there. I was very scared and shaken when I saw it. I thought, what the heck is that? It looked like a man, but as I was watching it, I noticed it had hair covering its whole body with a mixture of gray, dark brown, and white on its chest. The head and the feet, also the hands, were all dark in color, and the legs were a dark gray. The face was lighter in color, and when I saw the face, it was turned towards my direction. The forehead was the most unusual, and it really stuck out to me, with no neck. It had a little slump in the shoulder, and its arms spanned down to its knees. It took large steps and its arms swung back and forth. The distance from the highway was about 60 yards in total. I told my mom to stop, but she was scared, too scared to turn around. Due to witness request, the name will be removed and Stephanie will sit as the placeholder name. It was back a few years ago when we were still scouting put-ins and takeouts on the non-commercial sections of the San Juan River. We would drive these narrow two tracks to find river access, and then float and scout these sections accordingly. We could not find any real info either in print or on the web about the river from Shiprock, New Mexico, down here to this creek in Utah. We had to export ourselves via kayaks and canoes. Nowadays, we have a river company through the Navajo tribe and take people down the sections all the time. We found a put-in at mile 10, just outside of Shiprock. It's about 10 bumpy bad road miles to the river, but provided a good launch area. We used my truck to put in with the boats. We had already dropped a truck off at Four Corners Bridge, some 17 river miles away. The day was fairly warm for early March, mid-60s I think. We did the run in under five hours. We loaded the boats and gear in the truck and headed back over to my pickup truck. It was getting dark by the time we got there. My ex-wife and my partner pulled up out of the small canyon before me. We carry walkie-talkies on the river and in our vehicles. I turned mine on and told them to wait up. My partner replied with, sure, no problem. Just then, before he let go of the button, I heard Stephanie, my ex-wife, screaming. What's going on up there? I shouted through my walkie-talkie. Stephanie sees something up by that old sheep corral. Turn your brights on. I can't see it because I'm trying to get out of here and not wreck this truck. She says, look, it's on your right. You'll be coming up right up on it. Sure enough, I got right behind them. I saw the back of it as it turned in my headlights. I saw a few swings of its arms and it was out there. This was not what I expected to see at all. I would put it at about seven feet tall, skinny, gray in color, arms past the knees, like looking at the back of a Grinch head pointy. 
Stephanie got a better look at it than I did. She said it looked right at her, does not much want to talk about it. In the very first incident, two sisters and daughters who is in her 80s were on their way to their mother's place to pick up their children for a birthday party. As they turned onto the dirt and gravel road to the house, they saw something sitting by the left side of the road. When the car lights illuminated it, it stood up to a height estimated to be seven feet or more. One of the sisters refused to look at it after one glance. It was reported to me that the eyes seemed to be red in the headlights. It was hairy all over, with a kind of pointed head, long arms and no neck. It moved toward the river. The sisters turned into their mother's driveway and did not see it again. They were very frightened and were sure it was not a bear nor a human. This happened in March of 1997, as I recall. My husband and I were visiting our adopted family in August of 1997. Having arrived there on August 21st, we were in our pop-up camper, parked by the river and behind the brush across the driveway from Grandma's house. Next door to her house lives her son and his family. Her son was away on a fire, along with his son, but his wife and daughter were at home. On August 21st, we had set up our camp, ate, visited, and went to bed early, around 11 p.m. Everyone was asleep, except me, and I was drifting into sleep, when I felt a very strong jolt to our camper, which made everything rattle. I thought it might be a horse or cow, but the impact was higher than a horse or a cow, like at the roof line. I was too scared to move, but didn't know why. Nothing more happened, so I went to sleep and told my husband about it the next morning. He sleeps like a log, so of course he didn't wake up. On Saturday, August 23rd, the whole group of us, maybe 20 people, had cooked and eaten outside, and after cleanup, we all sat around the fire in the brush arbor, enjoying the cool evening and visiting old friends. I was talking, and way off somewhere, kind of remember hearing a sound like a baby crying. The little girl sitting next to me said, did you hear that? I responded that I didn't hear anything, and she said that weird howl. Immediately, the adults stood up and told the children to go in the house. That was it. Time for bed. They all heard it, whatever it was. My husband and I and our two little granddaughters sat there for a short while, wondering what was going on, and then went into our trailer and went to sleep. The dogs barked and howled almost all night. The next morning, Sunday, August 24th, I woke up and went to the house for coffee. All of the family members were already there talking. I listened for a while on the topic of conversation and it intrigued me, so I asked what everybody was talking about. Dead silence. I jokingly said that it sounded to me like they were talking about Bigfoot. One, and then another of them began to talk about it, and I said, why didn't you tell me? Their response was that they didn't want to scare us off. I told them I'd been interested in this for years. Then, the stories came out, such as the first one cited herein. Two of the grandchildren the previous night had been on their way to their grandmother's house. As they turned off the main highway to the old highway, where there's a sharp left-hand curve in the road, about 50 yards in, and where the remains of an old highway continues to a dead end to the right, they saw the being. It was right at the curve where they saw the crossing in front of their vehicle, a very large, hairy, long-armed figure, which they observed to them, crossed the dead end portion of the road and crashed up the hill through the brush. They continued on to Grandma's house, as we all sat and listened to this, and every one of us believed them. L. S., a son-in-law, suggested that we all go look for a sign of the site where this occurred. L. is an Eskimo from Alaska, and he is also a hunter. I wanted to go, but still in my pajamas and robes, so I told them to go without me. When I got there, they were gone, so I returned back to the house. When they returned, Lewis said there were droppings, tracks, and matted down grass, and chicken feathers, but no signs of bones or other scraps. 
His view of the droppings, as related to me then, is that they didn't belong to a bear or any other animal that he knows of. They contained seeds and plant material and bore a resemblance to human feces, except for size and quantity. Before we went in early August, she said she woke up early one morning and noticed a huge handprint of her dining room window, which is a large window beneath which the table sits. She went outside to clean it off so the grandkids and others wouldn't see it and be scared. Grandma is proud of her flower garden of lilies, and she said the flowers were trampled down by something heavy. Again, there were no horses around. In the kitchen on August 24th, I was told that the howls and screams occur frequently at night, and that they have all heard them and cannot identify them. All remarked about how bad the odors have been and smelt on nights when the dogs, which are tied up, have barked and barked. In fact, one of the granddaughters was sitting in the living room one night, watching TV, when she happened to look out the window to see something looking in at her. All she could say that it was big and hairy. The family advises that these strange sounds and occurrences begin in their area about November of 96. There is plenty of cover in the area, including a wash in which grandma and her daughters go to gather tea, which activity they told me they were now afraid to do. They told me that easy access to the river, etc. is why there are sightings. They do not believe that there is anything that they could have done. I used to be a scuba instructor in Indonesia. Groups could book me for a casual lesson, or for like a week's worth of diving, where they could then earn a diving license. So this one group books me. They're a mixed group in their early 20s. Couples and friends. Good people. Silver spoons galore, but I'm not one to judge. Our first activity was underwater walking. Now. I had never tried underwater walking, since it was relatively new at the time, but I'm keen to try it. So we pile into a little boat and take the short trip out towards the mothership. Now this is just a naval term for a larger boat that the smaller ones like ours can work from, but we get on one step further to justify this, having spray painted one of those huge gray alien heads onto the hull. It looked awesome, and naturally the kids loved it. Underwater, walking itself was similar to the time I did snuba, which is scuba plus snorkeling equals snuba, in the Caribbean, and that the oxygen tanks float up on the surface of the water instead of being on the diver's back. The other major difference to regular diving is that instead of having a scuba mask to breathe out of, we had these big old sci-fi looking helmets on. I mean, they looked like they were props from the old Lost in Space show that used to be on TV. I went first, and the procedure was pretty simple. I hung onto the ladder with the majority of my body in the water. They placed a small foam rubber ring on my head to cushion the helmet, and then they finally put the helmet on. The second that it was on my body, I felt its weight forcing me to the bottom of the ocean. It was kind of scary because I went down pretty fast, which caused the pressure to build up quickly. I made sure to swallow and yawn a bunch to negate the effects of the pressure, and I was fine. Also, I could feel never really to get a deep breath of air, because as I breathed in, the helmet began to make a vacuum, and I would have to stop to let it fill in with more air. Then, two members of the mixed group of teens followed suit before a scuba diving man came down to be our guide. He handed all of us a piece of bread in a plastic bag which drew all the fish to us. That was a lot of fun, watching otherwise timid fish practically swarming us. There were metal guiding handrails on the ocean floor, which I followed. The two kids followed behind me. It was very difficult to walk because the current was surprisingly strong and the helmets were quite heavy. We found it all incredibly enjoyable though, and I had been diving for years, and even to me it was a novelty. As I breathed, there was a constant loud whirring sound as the water, but pressure on the oxygen tube. It was kind of annoying, but it meant that I was getting air, which was obviously good. That's why it was so scary when the sound suddenly stopped. 
I was confused, but it quickly came back on. After about a few seconds, and I could breathe again. It happened one more time. And again. It came back on very quickly. I rationalized it by assuming that my tank had run empty, and they were switching it to a different one. No big deal. I did not understand how they would run out so quickly, but I didn't think too hard about it. It soon came back on, and I could breathe, so no big deal. After about 10 or so minutes, I'm guessing, I have no idea how long we were down there. The guide points at me and indicates that he wants me to climb over the railing. I was very confused, but I did it after he made it very clear that that is what he wanted. It was kind of hard to see out of any peripheral side of the mask, so it was easy to get lost. I looked back behind me to make sure that the teenagers saw where I went and did not get lost. We made eye contact, so I assumed we were all good, and then turned back around to follow the guide. He had me walking in a very small path between two corals, so I went very slowly to make sure that I did not cut my legs up on them. It was hard due to the strong underwater current, my unwieldy helmet, and an occasional tug by the air tube as I pulled it taut. As I reached the guide, my air stopped again. I figured it was no big deal like the previous two times and continued on. I followed him a bit and it still didn't come on. Five seconds with oxygen, then 10. I began to get confused. Was this some kind of joke? If so, it wasn't funny at all. 15 seconds. I thought to myself, don't panic. They always tell you not to panic. I panicked. I started taking quicker and quicker breaths, but I forced myself to stop that. Thanks to previous training, I knew that was the worst thing I could do. I spun around to the guide and started pounding my fist on my chest. That was the sign for I can't breathe. He seemed to notice and started walking away. I can only hope that he was taking me to the boat. I thought maybe I should just try and shrug off the helmet and swim to the surface. I didn't know if I had enough air to make it, and I didn't know if the boat was above me. I mean, I didn't want to actually hit my head. I didn't know if I could actually shrug it off, and I didn't want to get the bends, so I figured it wouldn't be a good idea. 30 seconds. I started to notice that I was getting less and less oxygen with each breath. Water was starting to seep into my helmet. I had to look up to breathe with what little air I had. I grabbed hold of the guide's arm so that I wouldn't lose him, and also so that he would understand the gravity of the situation. I gave him quite the death grip. 40 seconds without oxygen now, and my lungs burned for air. I saw the ladder of the boat. I knew that all I had to do was make it there, and I would be okay. I must have gotten some sort of adrenaline rush with a renewed hope, because I almost forgot about my lack of air. I fumbled for the ladder for a few seconds. It was hard to tell distances to the helmet, because it was a bit of a magnifying aspect to it. Before I grabbed it and started pulling myself up, as I broke the surface, air came rushing into my helmet, and I took a nice deep breath. Breathing had never felt better. It was definitely the scariest experience of my life, and I would not recommend underwater walking ever. Spring break has always been one of my favorite times of the year. As a child, I used to vacation to the ocean or sometimes even Disney World. And now as an adult, my wife and I go on vacations together around the time that children are out of school for spring break. For me, there is no better place than the ocean at night. The way the moonlight glows and the waves of the water and the sound of the waves crashing always gives me a peace of mind. Well, this particular year, my wife and I saved up a little extra money and rented a private house right on the ocean. It was amazing. Drinking my coffee on the ocean every morning and enjoying an alcoholic beverage every night as the moon rose was truly amazing. One day, I passed out on the beach for a couple of hours, only to awaken with horrible nightmares. They were strange, and the only thing I remember is darkness and screaming. A lot of screaming. My wife asked me if I was okay 
And I said, yeah, just a little shook up. The night my wife went to bed fairly early, but I could not sleep. Not sure if it was the long nap I had taken earlier in the day, or the horrible nightmares that woke me up from said nap. Either way, I wanted to clear my head, so I decided to go for a walk on the ocean. As I kept walking on the desolate beach, I approached something that appeared to be glowing in the sand. I started to approach quickly, but with a little bit of caution. It was some sort of glowing red ball. It's kind of hard to describe, but I'll do the best I can. It didn't look cheap plastic. It literally was a glowing red ball of light that didn't seem to have any actual shape. I stared rather intently until it flashed so bright that it knocked me down on the sand. The ball flew up in the air and shot itself out onto the ocean, and as it reached the horizon, there was a huge blast of light. Within seconds, the sky looked as if it was storming, but there was no rain. I saw all sorts of colors in the sky and a lot of red flashes that I can only describe as looking like heat lightning. But these flashes were lighting up the entire sky. As I watched all the intense flashes of light before I knew it blacked out completely. The next thing I remember is my wife waking me up in the next morning in a frantic panic because she didn't know where I was. I tried explaining to her what I had witnessed, but she said I had just been dreaming and was upset that I wandered off last night, accusing me of getting drunk and passing out. But it's important to note that I don't get drunk and I would never just wander off and never come back. Something I can't explain happened that night. Can somebody let me know what I experienced? Could it have been a vivid dream if I passed out? Has anybody else experienced something similar? Either way, I know that I don't have the same affinity for oceans and vacations as I did before this occurrence. This happened back when I was in fifth grade. School ended, so we were just playing around. We got bored, and one of us made a Ouija board. We played it. The coin was moving, and I thought my friends were just playing with it. Well, the ghost's name was Rory, and a girl. We didn't finish the game since my mom is already at the gate of the school, waiting to pick me up. That night, I was alone at my room when I heard footsteps outside my door. I went outside my room to see who it was, but there's nobody. After eating dinner, I went to my room. I was shocked when I entered because the sliding windows are open and the blinds are up and my closet is also open. The papers that are on my desk are scattered everywhere. I was so sure that the windows are closed and that my room is very neat and tidy. My imagination is just playing with my mind, so I thought it was Rory who did it. I just cleaned the mess up. That same night, I can't sleep. I would hear footsteps outside of the hallway and occasional knocking on my window, even though my room is on the second floor. I thought it was the wind, even though it's summer and it's hot and there's practically no breeze. I still managed to sleep though. I woke up to the sound of giggling of a girl. I opened my eyes and saw a girl standing at the foot of my bed. She looks like the ghost from the movie The Ring. The difference is she has a smaller hair and her height is smaller. I shouted but there's no voice coming out of my mouth. Then I realized I'm numb and I can't move. I love reading horror stories and I read in one article that moving the peaky finger of your foot will help you move. So I did. It stopped and I fell asleep. Then minutes later it happened again. This time. It happened for like two minutes, and then the girl, Rory, took the pillow beside me, and she gave it to me, and then she tilted my head towards the pillow, not trying to break my leg. Then she vanished. I woke up, because apparently my mom is waking me up so I can go to school. The pillow is beside me, exact position where she put it. My mom is a lifesaver. I don't know what will happen if she didn't wake me up. I had many sleep paralysis and the footsteps and the knocking is still there. 
Sometimes I can even see a girl's shadow. It's been four years since that happened. I don't know what happened to my friends or if they experienced the same since we don't talk about paranormal stuff, but I'm the only one that's really into it. When I was in my early teens, I had an obsessive fascination with the occult and spiritualism. Basically anything to offer some sort of proof that there is more to this reality than what we believe. This all started in the early 90s when I saw Ouija boards for sale in our local small town grocery store. Needless to say, I bought it. I couldn't believe they actually sold these as games. Mind you, I lived in a small town and grew up disconnected from a lot of pop culture staples of that era. I would play the board often, mostly with my stepbrother, Dan, and stepsister, Holly, when they came to visit during the summer months and over the holidays. Both of them were considerably younger than myself, me being no older than 13 at the time. The board became an obsession, even though over 95% of the time, nothing would happen, or when it did move, we would receive short, nondescriptive messages. On one cold winter day, this was about to change. My siblings and I retreated upstairs in an attempt to play the board. We lit the usual candles and killed the lights. After a few attempts to summon a spirit, the planchet started to move. This time, it felt different. It glided with ease around the board and answered simple yes or no questions with great finesse. In disbelief, we took our fingers off the planchet. The moment we did so, the flame on the candle began to shrink dramatically. We quickly placed our fingers back on the planchet, and the flame immediately came back to life. We then asked, Where in the room are you? The pointer spelt out K-I-T-E. Well, we sat there confused for a moment, until we realized that I had a kite mounted to the ceiling above our heads. At this moment, the kite began to flutter as if there was a slight breeze. We lived in a log cabin that did not have a central air system. There were no fans running, so this was impossible and quite odd. We continued playing and I decided to ask, we'd like to know our spirit guide names which is a very new agey question as I look back. So I asked, what is my guide's name? The board spelled out Arthur. Dan asked for the name of his guide and the board lettered out Brett. And finally, Holly asked for hers and the board replied Gareth. We were all kind of shocked with the results and discontinued playing to go downstairs and to tell my mother the information we just received. After doing so, she replied, I don't know, just look up the names in the dictionary. At the time, I thought this was pretty unhelpful advice, but reluctantly, I did. A dictionary probably is not the best resource for looking up names, but this was before the internet, so I grabbed the dictionary off the shelf and began flipping through the pages. Searching the name Brett came up with a few uninteresting results. Next, I looked up Arthur. Not surprisingly, King Arthur, along with maybe a few other Arthurs were on the list. I then proceeded to look up Gareth. When I did so, my jaw hit the floor. Gareth was King Arthur's nephew. I was completely dumbfounded. I knew at this moment that the names we received were probably weren't the fictional names or actual names of spirit guides. These were purposefully crafted by something with the full awareness that what we could or would look them up and draw a connection between the two. Now, before you go and assume my stepbrother and or sister pushed the planchet, keep this in mind. Dan has always had a learning disability. Even today, he still has difficulty spelling and use his voice to text because of it. I am 100% confident he couldn't have moved it. I am also confident that neither of them at the time were well versed in genealogy of any mythology. I have observed this with a skeptical point of view since the day it happened. This still remains as one of the few times that the board actually moved, 
more or less provided us with legible, specific details. To this day, at the age of 39, I remain convinced that what we received was not from us, but somewhere else. Something that I believe knew full well that my mother was going to tell me to look up. This story takes place in the year of 1993. I was a sophomore in high school. I must emphasize the importance of the year, as cell phones, internet, and the effortless forms of mass communication at your fingertips was non-existent. There are ample amounts of backstory, but mainly I cannot get into the feel of this story as this is the only one I can safely tell you. You'll understand why as the story goes on. At this time in my life, my friends and I were very carelessly using a Ouija board that I found in my deceased great uncle's attic right after he passed. Again, I will not go into many details here other than it was wooden, old, and had no instruction. We took it home and my sisters and I, along with my friends, began to play with it. Weeks went by, a few months went by, and lots of stuff was happening in my house and with my friends. Me. Strongly being a believer in the paranormal, didn't question much of what was happening, as it was witnessed not just by me, but many others. I saw such occurrences change the beliefs of staunch skeptics in a matter of moments. I was terrified most of the time, sleeping with my lights always on, or never alone. At times, I was even amused by it. We'll use the term it here, as I cannot call and will not call it by its name. Then came a day in early spring of 93 that my friends and I were sitting at a round table in the library of our high school. The topic always seemed to circle back around to what was happening at my house. There were four of us sitting at a table. Myself, Monica, Kim, and Suzanne. I was beginning to get a little agitated and begin to feel arrogant. So arrogant that I said aloud to my friends almost these exact words. If you're so powerful and so real, then you wouldn't be stuck in my house. So, show us a sign you can hear us beyond there and the board. And just like that, the lights went out in the entire library and school for about five seconds. When they came back on, I continued my overconfident banter by laughing and saying, Really? Is that all you have? The bell rang shortly after, and it was time to go home. I didn't think much of the incident after, but knew my egotistical, fake act may have caused some consequences down the line. That night when I fell asleep, I had a dream. I'm not even sure I can call it that. I can't even call it a nightmare, because that word connotates fiction to me. This was one of those dreams or visions, if you may, that you wake up from and feel it. You can recite every line in detail as if you were still in it. To this day, I could still feel the resonation and remember every bit. The dream starts off in the morning and as I begin to walk into school from the street, I am immediately plagued with the sense of terror and a sense that I was slowly being chased. There were black hooded figures, fully cloaked, no signs of human life underneath, just a human form. There were six of them, all with their heads down. It was broad daylight, and they were each carrying a torch. In the middle of them was a very tall figure, again, all in black with a red stripe in front of its cloak. He was not carrying a torch, but rather a long pewter staff of some sort. This is when I stopped studying the details of who this was. I knew who it was, and I knew they were after me, especially him. They were not running or in any type of haste. It was slow and methodical. I ran in the school fast and frantically began to look for a hiding spot in the library, as that's where my dream put me. I quickly jumped over these bookshelves which were low to the ground, both in the dream world and in the real world, and balled up on the shelf, hiding and praying not to be found. I then woke up, breathless. I said few words as I got ready for school and onto the bus that morning. None of my friends involved in the library situation or the Ouija board stuff in general were on the same bus route, and I dare not speak a word of it to the kids I rode the bus with, 
as most of them I despised. When I arrived at school, finding my friends Monica and Kim waiting for me at the north entrance as they did every morning, I began to tell them the details of the dream. We had just entered the main hallway as I was finishing the dream details when running from the south entrance, which was a pretty good distance from us, was Suzanne. I do not feel I need to drive home the point that there were no cell phones and no conceivable way of Suzanne getting any of this info. This is exactly as it happened and is 100% accurate. Trying as hard as she could to catch her breath, she looked at me and said, I have a message for you from him. Not it, I must emphasize. Tell Nicole she can run, but she can't hide. To this day, every time I tell this story, I envisioned him laughing, still saying, I found you. So, I got the chance to reconnect with some of my friends over in Colorado, who are also of the Sioux Tribe in Arapaho. These are the people that shared with me the same tales recently that I've discussed with you. The Dogmen and Bigfoot waging wars against each other to be able to eat the Arapaho tribe that was defending themselves against these beasts. They love and watch your channel, and they wanted me to share more of their stories that they have. These are stories that they have obtained from their own chiefs that have been passed down from generations, as well as more tales from their own tribe that they would like to share with you. My other friend, who is part Sioux, also has very similar tales from his own tribe, dealing with not only Bigfoot and Dogmen, but what they consider to be the Thunderbird as well, especially more so in the Great Plains area. There were just certain places that were off limits for hunting and foraging, for any sort of food and supplies because these large birds patrolled the perimeter of the area. Usually, it was always in the upper mountainside, but other times, it wasn't. Supposedly, somewhere along the way, one of the chief's daughters had befriended a thunderbird and was able to ride it before it tricked her and knocked her off its back while up in midair, and she fell to her death. Thunderbirds, from what I've gathered, aren't near as hostile as Dogmen are, or Bigfoot, but they would take pride in stealing kills from hunters by swooping down and taking the deer whole or waiting for the kill to claim the body. Unlike other birds, they have a very distinctive call, kind of like how a hawk does, or even an eagle. You could hear it from far away and know exactly what kind of bird it was. I wasn't told any story about a Thunderbird having a conflict with a Bigfoot or a Dogman, but I'm sure it has happened. They were more elusive than the other two creatures and were not near as hostile or aggressive. They were not attacking villages, but they were waiting and watching a lot of the time. Many of the times, they would show up in full view of the villages and they would bring upon them storms, droughts, famine, and worse. They almost acted like an omen even though they weren't seen as much. There is a reason they have a name Thunderbird. Although the Arapaho and Sioux Indians had their own name for them, just like they did with Dogman and Bigfoot, I don't think their name had any direct translation to Thunderbird, but it did mean something similar. The one friend of mine who was Sioux Indian shared with me some stories about back in the early 1800s that these giant blackbirds with white markings on them would fly out of the mountains in South Dakota, fly down, pick up villagers and hunters, even white men, and fly up high in the air and drop them to kill them. From the sounds of it, these things didn't fly into the villages, but anybody who wandered into a specific area or territory was generally targeted. This leads me to believe that between both my friends who shared very similar stories that the Thunderbird is not only a very real cryptid, but, like the other two cryptids, Dogman and Bigfoot, are very territorial beings. While seeming much more elusive, they still can be just as dangerous since they can just easily pick a person up with ease and drop them from a hundred plus feet in the air to their death. A couple of hunters had found a large bird nest, as they described, near the base of one of the mountains that they were near and found many human skulls and bones. It wasn't made entirely clear if these cryptids would pick people up 
and drop them from the sky to kill them and then eat them, or if it was just a killing tactic to eliminate threats. The feathers from these creatures were humongous. These creatures persisted even when white men started traveling to the area and colonizing. They too became victim and knew the ferocity of these cryptids. Unfortunately, muzzle loaders and guns didn't seem to be effective against these kinds of flying beasts, but there were certain areas that they would not venture into in fear that these things would grab them. I am almost wondering if states with very rocky terrain, with lots of mountains and hills, makes the perfect environment for these kinds of cryptids. Plenty of places to hide, and more than enough places to have a nest without anyone ever bothering you or discovering where you are. Even today, there is still miles upon miles of wilderness all over the US that remains uncharted or too thick for us humans to venture off into. It's very possible that these things have made their nests in places that are impossible for us to get to, especially with the vast amount of mountains and steep cliffs that are all over. In fact, I recently listened to one of your other Thunderbird stories where a gentleman climbed down a steep cliff, if I'm remembering correctly, and discovered what he thought was a Thunderbird's nest. Well, his description was pretty close to what my friend's story matched up with. And his story, I believe, were there were animal bones, but in that story I got from my friend, they only found human remains. I don't really tend to find too much evidence though, based on what I know about these things, that there's any signs of them ever being on the east coast. However, the signs that I was hearing about that happened on the east coast resemble that of a pterodactyl. Those sightings go all the way down to the southern Florida area, even into Cuba. No, it's not a thunderbird, but there seems to be a continuity with these large flying bird-like cryptids all around the United States. Going back to that Thunderbird encounter though you posted, before the man who went down to the cliff in Northern California, I had heard other Thunderbird encounters around that area before. It seems like when you mix mountain cliffs and forests, you create the environment for these things to thrive in. I personally believe that's why there are so many good sightings in the state of Colorado, such as reptilians, Bigfoot, Dogman, Thunderbird, and more. I find it very interesting that several of the supposed encounters and sightings that many of the natives recall of this Thunderbird are usually all large blackbirds of some sort. They all talk about the same thing, distinctive white markings on their body which never seem to coincide with a specific pattern or shape. I've heard some descriptions that talk about it being very similar looking to a stark black eagle, while others say that it looks more like a raven. I've heard others say that it looks like its own bird entirely, with a pointed down beak at the end, kind of like a falcon has. Either way, we need to keep close eyes on the skies around us when we're out, and if we see something large flying our way, we know it's near. A family friend of mine operates a small seaplane business in Florida where people pay a small sum of money and he takes them out on a tour throughout overlooking the Everglades. Well, it was my birthday, and I had never been on a plane before. Shocking, I know. Just so you can get an idea of how small these planes are, there are practically two passenger planes, I think. You know, the ones that fly over water. They're pretty small compared to any commercial airline, but large enough for you to get around in. They aren't luxurious by any means, and I'm not a planes girl by any means, so I just know they're called seaplanes. If I had to guess, I'm gonna say 20 to 30 feet from the front nose to the very back. I really have no idea how big the wingspan is. As I was saying, this family friend of mine took me out for my birthday, and we're flying over the Everglades, and when he starts panicking and pointing out in front of us, flying a little underneath us and perpendicular was the largest bird we have ever seen in our lives. I vaguely heard of a creature called the Thunderbird, but I've not known what it is. Now, I don't know if this is a Thunderbird or if it's real, but I do know now that there are very large birds out there that far exceed any size we know about. 
The bird I saw was extremely large, and a very predatorial looking bird at that. All gray, that faded to a smoky charcoal color. This bird had a wingspan that easily matched the size of the plane we were in. I couldn't believe it. My friend and I were in total awe and could not stop staring at this monstrosity of a bird. It was flying relatively low, only a little higher than the tips of the trees, and it never once seemed to look up in our direction or even care that we were flying over. It didn't come across like it was in a hurry, just calmly flying in the direction it was heading, which was south. It's all him and I could talk about for the rest of the flight. We had no idea what kind of bird it was, and we're convinced that we discovered a new species of swamp bird. Little do I know now that I probably more than likely saw an actual thunderbird in the flesh. Being in the Navy, you get to see a lot of the world, and with two deployments currently under my belt, I have seen a lot of crazy things. However, this occurred during my last deployment, and it's a moment that I will never forget. Not just due to the fact that it left me physically shaken, but there was no explanation for what we saw that night. For security and privacy reasons, I will not be discussing the name or type of ship that I was stationed on. I hope you all can understand. I had watched from midnight to four in the morning, and my watch station is in a little area right behind the bridge. In this area, I was the supervisor of a small team of four others, making sure that they did their job properly, which was to make sure that we knew what other ships are out there, who they are, and where they come from. The midnight watch is usually pretty boring, as nothing really happens around that time. The bridge team tends to keep to themselves around that time and only come to bug us when they have questions about a ship or any possible ships in the area. We had one person out on the bridge though to talk to the lookouts, which are people stationed around the ship that made visual reports to the bridge on the other ships or any marine life that could be near us. To ensure that I knew what the lookouts were reporting, I had a speaker hooked up to the station that the lookouts used to talk to each other and make reports. Usually during this time, the lookouts like to talk about nonsense and gossip amongst each other. I will admit, a lot of their conversations were funny. On this particular night, however, one of the lookouts made a report to the bridge and I knew something was wrong because she sounded extremely nervous. Here is the initial report. Bridge, Port Fantel. Go ahead, Port Fantel. Bridge, the water behind us is glowing. Say again? I can't explain it in any other way, but the water is glowing. What? I said to myself as I went out onto the bridge and talked to my guy out there, making sure he heard what I had heard as well. We both reported it to the junior officer of the watch, and he thought it was weird as well but claimed that it might be a bioluminescent algae, which, although extremely common, it made sense at the time. I told my guy to pass the word back to the lookout in hopes it would calm her down. As I walked back to my station, I heard the lookouts talking to the speaker, teasing and making fun about how her reporting of a glowing algae. After that, all seemed normal. About 20 minutes later, I heard the lookout come out again. This time, talking to one of the other lookouts. Starboard Fantel, Port Fantel. Yeah. Do you see the water glowing in the distance? Yeah, what about it? I think it's following us. You're stupid. No, seriously, look at it. We passed it about 20 minutes ago. We shouldn't be able to see it anymore. You're either really tired or really paranoid. You need to calm down. After that, the lookout again reported it to the bridge, and this time, the junior officer of watch told him to pass word to inform him when the glowing algae got closer. I went outside to check myself, and I did indeed see it. 
although it could be nothing. I was a bit on edge also. Then, out of nowhere, I visually see the glow rapidly get closer to the ship, coming in from behind. I ran back inside and I heard the lookouts making the report, but before I could inform the bridge, the water around the ship started to glow. The glowing faded slowly, then got brighter every few seconds, and everyone on the bridge was completely dumbfounded. No one moved or spoke, just stood in place, watching as the bridge filled in and out with an ominous green glow. This went on for a couple of minutes, but felt like an eternity. I don't know what others were thinking, but I honestly thought that this was the end. We then watched as whatever was glowing beneath the ship slowly move away from us, moving ahead of us. Then, in a sudden flash of light, it was completely gone. Everyone on the bridge remained silent for about another minute, and even though everybody was shaken up, we all tried to get past it, and many went on like it never happened. Since there was no official report of the incident, and since it was never passed down to the other watches, this event technically never happened, except to those who witnessed it, which happens more than you think. The captain was never informed on what happened either. I have not been able to stop thinking about that day, and I haven't told anyone about it. Not even to my wife and family. Not because they won't believe me, but because they worry about me constantly when I'm out at sea. So I kept it to myself, until now. I just wanted to share in what my experience was and pass the word that there is something in the ocean. What is it? I don't know. And that truly terrifies me. The most deadly shark attack in recorded history began on July 30th, 1945. The USS Indianapolis, a Portland-class heavy cruiser of the United States Navy, was taking part in a top-secret mission of the utmost importance. It was tasked with carrying enriched uranium to an island in the South Pacific, along with other parts required for the assembly of the world's first deployable atomic bomb. As history shows, the crew of the Indianapolis were successful in their mission, completing the delivery in record speeds that are unbroken, even by modern naval vessels. However, as they sailed back towards Leyte for training before the invasion of Okinawa, tragedy struck. Just after midnight on July 30th, the Indianapolis was spotted by a Japanese submarine. Without any escorts to defend her, the Indianapolis was a prime target, and the Japanese closed in for the kill. The Indianapolis did not have sonar to detect submarines. They were completely unaware of the danger in which they found themselves. At exactly 12.15 a.m., two Type 95 torpedoes smashed into the right side of the vessel, instantly killing dozens of American sailors and causing obscene amounts of damage to the ship's structure. It took just 12 minutes of panic and terror for the ship to sink completely, taking down over 300 of the crew along with her. The surviving crew members, lacking life jackets and lifeboats, were set adrift among the waves in almost complete darkness. Many thought the worst was over, but their nightmare had only just begun. Naturally, the sailors floating among the debris were expecting to be rescued in a matter of hours, days at most, but the horrible fact was that nobody was coming to the rescue. Despite sending several emergency signals before the ship went down, the Navy had somehow lost track of the Indianapolis. Nothing was made of the fact that the ship failed to arrive at Lady, and many of the emergency messages that were received by nearby ships and naval bases were completely ignored. Declassified records later showed that one such commander in the Philippines was drunk and had told his staff to not disturb him. Another wrongly assumed the SOS calls were some kind of Japanese trap. The roughly 900 men who actually survived the torpedo attack were now exposed to a new, perhaps even deadlier danger. It was dawn when the survivors saw the first sharks in the waters around them. The pure carnage and chaos of the sinking had attracted hundreds of oceanic white tip and tiger sharks from miles around. 
Some were apparently as large as 15 feet long. It must have been absolutely terrifying for the survivors, seeing huge dorsal fins emerging from the water as the predators began to surround them, circling, picking out the weakest links, those too weak to struggle. At first, the sharks focused on the dead bodies floating in the water. Many men had died of exposure, salt poisoning, or thirst, and it was these corpses that provided the easiest meals for the circling sharks. But soon, the lifeless bodies among the survivors had been completely devoured by the hungry predators, and it wasn't long before they turned their attention towards the living. The survivors later reported that they were losing at least three or four men to a shark attack every single day. At some points, they counted 20 to 30 sharks in the water, their dorsal fins breaking the waves to form an almost impenetrable barrier around the surviving sailors. The sharks would often swim towards the survivors, bumping into them to test for signs of life. The sailors never knew exactly when the attacks would come, and this took a serious toll on their sanity. Men would kick and pound the water, screaming bloody murder in an attempt to deter the sharks from attacking. But this only served to attract more and more of the fishy fiends, as it mimicking the thrashing of a wounded sea creature that served as a natural dinner bell for the hungry beasts. Every so often, a shark would lose patience and strike without mercy, rushing up from the briny depths to drag down a screaming survivor. Imagine it, hearing the man next to you let out an ear-splitting, blood-curdling scream before disappearing beneath the waves, never to be seen again. Some survivors recalled that the elements were perhaps just as deadly as the circling sharks. During the scorching heat of the daytime, men would pray for darkness, their faces blistering as the harsh Pacific sun beat down upon them, while at night, the water grew so cold that their teeth would shatter as hypothermia set in. Some would kick their legs and thrash their arms in futile attempts to keep warm. But again, this only mimicked the death throes of a wounded sea creature, making them a target for the circling sharks. As the floating sailors fought to survive, many of them succumbed to the horror of their experiences and began to lose their minds. Some men even began to hallucinate, seeing islands that weren't there, claiming they had heard rescue planes searching them in the skies above. One such surviving sailor recalls the heartbreaking moment that one of his shipmates finally lost his grip on his sanity. The man claimed he could see the Indianapolis floating in the water just a few feet below them, and that he could access the mess hall stores of purified water. He made repeated trips beneath the surface, inviting his comrades to join him in drinking the cool, fresh water he had found. But the man was drinking salt water, he died shortly afterwards from the effects of poisoning. Then, on the fourth day of their harrowing survival, a Navy seaplane happened to be passing overhead when they spotted the groups of surviving sailors floating in the waters below. One of the aircraft's crew members leaned out of the central hatch, waving down at the men. That's when the tears came. Tears of pure relief and salvation. They were saved, but out of the crew of almost 1,200 sailors, just 317 survived the ordeal. But for some, the horror, pain, and tragedy of the sinking would never end. Captain Charles McVeigh, commander of the Indianapolis, was one of the last abandoned of the ship's sinking. In November of 1945, he was court-martialed for failing to order his men to abandon ship in time resulting in the 300 or so sailors that sank with the ship to the bottom of the ocean. Cleared of this charge, he was instead convicted of hazardizing the ship, a naval term which describes the failure of a captain to properly maneuver his vessel to avoid the likelihood of a direct torpedo strike. Yet, aspects of the trial were controversial, as even the commander of the Japanese sub that sank the ship said that zigzagging the Indianapolis wouldn't have made a damn bit of difference and that he'd always found a way to sink her. The disgraced captain was cleared of all charges, was reinstated to his position, and retired as a rear admiral four years later in 1949. 
Yet, while many of the Indianapolis' survivors agreed that Captain McVeigh was not to blame for the ship's sinking, the sentiment was not shared by some of the grieving families of the fallen sailors. Captain McVeigh would often receive Christmas cards from the relatives of his dead crew members, but they did not have a remotely festive tone about them. Merry Christmas, you son of a bitch. Our family's holiday would be a lot merrier if you hadn't murdered my son read one card that McVeigh had received as late as 1960. Despite being cleared of blame, Captain McVeigh never forgave himself for his failures as a commander, even if it was during the most brutal and decisive war that mankind has ever known. Eventually, in 1968, McVeigh picked up a small toy sailor that reminded him of his naval service, walked out onto his front lawn, and shot himself with the very same revolver that the Navy had issued to him upon entry into the service. He was 70 years old. Over 23 years later, the largest war in human history had senselessly claimed yet another life. For context, I'm a 19-year-old male living in Canada. This incident that I will be talking about happened last year, in September of 2019. Now, I haven't shared this incident with my family or even some of my friends, since they will say that it's a bunch of hogwash and that I was making it all up for the attention. So back to the incident at hand. At the time, I was doing a program in Cadets, many called the Psych Hike, where Cadets would be sent deep into the woods and would be required to find a place to stay for roughly 50 minutes to an hour. Mind you, the psych hike occurred after 9 p.m., so we're pretty much sitting in the woods in the darkness with only starlight and moonlight. Another rule for the psych hike is that you are not allowed to talk or make any sound. Also, we are not allowed to walk to other cadets during the psych hike. It was roughly 8 p.m., the sun had already disappeared behind the horizon, leaving a reddish pink color in the sky. We were instructed to line up in alphabetical order. Then we were given two glow sticks. One was red and the other green. The red one was to only be used in emergencies and the green glow stick was supposed to be used for the all clear signal after the time was up. You were also given a whistle. It was also used to be in an emergency. So, after everybody's names were called, the supervisor asked any of the cadets participating if they would like to walk away now. One cadet, for privacy reasons, we will call him M, walked back to his cabin. The supervisor then told us to get behind him and follow him out to the campsite. I will explain the layout of the camp, as this will help the story make more sense. The cabins and the canteen are located at the center of the campsite. If you keep walking southward from the campsite for a mile, you would eventually reach an airfield. The airfield was surrounded by dense forest. Even in the daylight, it's hard for the sunlight to even get past the branches to the forest floor. Now, imagine the forest at nighttime. Daunting, right? Even the most brave captains wouldn't even venture into there. So, they decided to send us cadets in. Interesting. So, we were marched off to the airfield and were ordered to stand at the edge of the forest. And then, the supervisor started to send each cadet into the forest. We were told to only walk 25 paces into the woods. When it was my turn, I started walking into the forest. The only light source from where I was standing was the stars and moon and even that wasn't even strong enough to light up my path. After 25 steps, I found a comfortable place to sit behind a tree. I sat down and listened to the cadets in front of me march off into the woods. As the last cadet marched into the woods, everything fell silent. The only sounds were a couple of the animals in the forest running around. I honestly had no idea what I was truly getting myself into and thought this would just be an innocent experience that I could happily recount to friends and family. Boy, was I wrong. I think it was 15 minutes later when I heard a sound. Snapping. 
the sudden break in silence startled me. At first, I thought the time was up and that the cadets before me were making their way back to the airfield. I checked my watch, but we were only a couple of minutes in and that we still had a long time before the supervisor came and got us. Then, I heard it again, snapping. I looked around, but saw nothing. The moonlight illuminated only a bit of my surrounding. I could see only a couple of meters in front of me. For the next couple of minutes, I was fiddling with the glow sticks in my hand until I heard this low rumbling noise. Within seconds, this low rumble turned into a very deep and guttural growl that sounded like it came from something very large with a massive, massive set of lungs. I was freaking out at that moment. I didn't know what to do. If I tried to run away, I worried that whatever was making the noise would appear and rush me and I'd never be seen again. Maybe that was my paranoia. Maybe that was my fear overtaking me. And then it hit me. A scent of wet dog and rotting meat came wafting over to where I sat. When I smelt it, I retched and coughed a little. The smell was almost overbearing, so I held my nose tightly. Suddenly, in that moment, a feeling of dread and fear washed over me. I was suddenly paralyzed with fear. I started sweating and my vision turned blurry. This is when the growling started to move around me and not just stay stationary like before. It sounded demonic and raspy. It moved closer to me. I could hear it behind me. I was scared by this time, but I managed to look behind the tree. From the tree, at least 20 yards away, I could see a silhouette of something lumbering in the woods. It was tall, and when I mean tall, this thing had to be at least seven feet tall. It was radiating that horrid smell of blood, wet dog, and rotting meat. At first, I thought it was just a man, but when I looked closer, it clearly did not fit into the category of human. I guess the two cropped ears on top of its head gave that away rather quickly. Having hawks just like a dog does, with thick muscled legs and a torso the size of a ripped weightlifter, this thing could tower over me, even from a distance. This thing looked like it could bench 300 no problem. It was covered in long dark gray fur from what I could see in the minimal light, and it had large hands that held onto the tree next to it that kind of resembled raccoon hands, but with long claws on the end of each fingertip. It was standing perfectly erect, puffing at its chest almost, but what really made my heart stop was its head. The head looked similar to a wolf, but its snout was long, full of teeth that stuck out of its snout just like a crocodile's does. Long, sharp, jagged teeth that didn't fit at all what a canine should have looked like. It had deep sunken in eye sockets and a very strong brow bone. The eyes glowed a very dull yellow. It looked very unnatural. The entire thing looked incredibly evil and just looking at this thing was paralyzing. The head was also humongous, like it wasn't proportionate to its body either. I tried my best not to scream, fearing that I would draw unneeded attention. It stood there and continued to watch me closely, almost as if it was observing every move I was making, and eventually walked back into the darkness. When it walked back and was out of eyesight, I still kept silent, fearing it would still be able to hear me. I sat there in silence for a while praying to God that whatever I had just seen wasn't planning on charging out of the woods at me to take me away. I wasn't even really sure what to do. I decided my best plan of attack was to just lie and wait for my supervisors to come back because I was far too afraid to get up and move. That thing couldn't be too far, and maybe, just maybe, it was waiting for me to get up and make a move so it could trap me. I didn't know what it was or what it was planning but it just, it didn't feel right. I had to do my best not to have a literal mental breakdown right there on the spot. It's funny, you know, growing up as a kid, when you hear about things like this that look like this, 
you're always told, oh, those don't exist. That's only in your imagination. All that's doing is setting somebody up for when they actually have a true encounter with something that isn't supposed to exist out here. I wasn't prepared mentally in the slightest. I had no way to handle it properly, and I still don't. It seemed like forever until the supervisors finally came and picked us up. I didn't talk for the rest of the night. The supervisors tried to talk to me, but all I could really do was nod and shake my head to questions. I was too overtaken by complete fear to accurately even process their questions, let alone give them all the information they wanted out of me. I felt like a little kid who had just experienced a trauma or an abusive situation. My brain was still trying its hardest to process what had just happened. Is what happened to me reality? Or did I just dream it all? Was the fear I experienced even real? Next morning in the cafeteria, I was talking to some of my friends about the psych hike when one of my friends asked, Hey, did any of you guys smell that last night? Everyone looked at him and started to talk about how they had smelled that horrible scent and felt the sense of dread and fear wash over them. I was the only one that was silent. When I went back home, I did some research and found nothing. Nothing concrete anyway. Everything led to creepypasta and scary stories, which is not what I'm about. I want to be taken seriously. I need somebody that I can talk to and tell my story. Desperate, I have now reached out to several people who are supposed researchers and investigators hoping to get some potential answers. At least they believe my story, and I can have some resolve and ease of mind, knowing I'm not crazy. In a weird, morbid way, it's comforting to know that there are other people out there with experiences that closely resemble mine. What did I encounter that night? What was that thing in the woods that I saw? And I hope that I'll never see it again. This didn't happen recently, but when I was a younger guy in my 20s, I had made the connection years earlier in a very odd way as a kid. Well, kid being still in my 20s. So that really wasn't the case in the sense that I encountered these entities. Instead, what I had a sense of was awareness. A sense where I knew these things were real and out to get me if I made the wrong move at any given time. Things we don't know about exist in our world and in the wild. Things we can only think belong in our nightmares. But that couldn't be further from the truth. I went out camping in the outback of the mountains in Idaho. And the night before, I was attacked. I was sleeping underneath the stars with a group of six to seven other people. And we heard what sounded like a low-pitched hiss-growl sound coming from behind us. It woke us all up and we sat up and looked back to the sound. We had the impression that it was coming from behind us, and then we began to hear it all around us, surrounding us. We realized it wasn't just a singular sound, but a bunch of them. My roommate, who I was camping with at the time here, started to reach for his revolver, but I was just scared because I didn't know what they were. I had no idea what animals were out there, I was an outdoor newbie at the time. My other friend, not my roommate, just a friend, had a shotgun lying next to him, and he was ready for anything. So I looked over at his gun, and then he looks over at me, and grabs it. He gives it a cock, and he's huddled there with it, with him, while we're all practically pooping bricks at this point, and this chorus of hissing and growling noises around us. It sounded like we were in a reptile zoo. You can't even begin to describe the feeling I had. I was too scared to even leave my sleeping bag. Then, in the minimal light we had from the night, we saw these tall figures begin to step towards us from the thickness of the trees and leaves around us. Tall, hulking reptile-like figures that stood on two legs. There were at least 10 or 12 of them, closing in on us, surrounding us. We were all so terrified that my friends at the time couldn't even fire their weapons. It was like a paralysis. And then this is where the story gets very strange, and I can't recall what happened, because none of us really know. 
even to this day. One by one, we all seem to black out and lose consciousness. Not fall asleep as you would think, when your senses are heightened and you know you're in danger, there is just no falling asleep. Not with adrenaline like that. You're experiencing a complete and primal fear like you never have. We were surrounded by an unknown large predatory animal, or a group of animals, closing in on us physically, and we didn't know what exactly we were dealing with. The other four of us that didn't come equipped with weapons just huddled and shook in the sleeping bag as I did. Like I said though, we all blocked out and lost consciousness. The next thing you know, the sun is up in the sky, and all seven of us are waking up in unison on top of this rocky cliff bluff, miles away from where we laid down our heads in our sleeping bags the previous night. No equipment, nothing. All of us were out of our sleeping bags. It's as if we were dragged here. We were scared, confused, had no idea what happened or what was going on. Both my friend with the shotgun and my roommate with a revolver, their weapons were gone. Our wallets were gone, watches, everything. The only thing we had were the clothes on our backs, quite literally. Our equipment and everything else we had could not be found. There were no indication of us being dragged, nor did we have cuts, scratches, or any sort of footprints or marks to show we were ever taken. It's like we were instantly knocked out and teleported to this tiny cliff. Judging by the sun, it was close to midday, and in our panic and confusion, we had no choice but to try and hike down this cliff and try and find our way back to civilization. Because the brush was so thick, there was really only one direction to travel down, and that's when we eventually ran into our camp from the night before. We had been taken about three miles in total from our spot. Our sleeping bags were still there. All of our equipment, but the weapons, wallets, personal belongings were gone. There were no footprints, no signs of a struggle, or ripping anybody out of their bags, nothing. It was disturbing. It's haunted me for a lot of these years to know exactly what went down that night. Our sleeping bags were in perfect condition. We gathered what we could and left the area, and everything was normal for the most part. We returned to civilization over the next day, since it was a long hike. And that, my friends, ended my adventuring in the outback for years afterward. I don't know if we were ever abducted, or if it was aliens, or what it could have been. I like to think those two leg walking reptile things we saw in the faint light coming towards us had something to do with all of this, but frankly, I just don't know. What I saw left me speechless to this day. It was about eight feet tall, and you could tell by looking at it, it was a mean killing creature. It had red markings over its scaly body. It looked very serpentish with long fangs. Even though it looked human, it wasn't. It looked at me and seemed surprised to see me and fled, as if it was nervous that it had been seen. I was walking around downtown in my small little town in Oklahoma in the early 90s, about midnight or 12.30 a.m. I was near a darker alley when I saw it, and it walked right into the light when our gaze met. I froze in place when I saw this thing, and the thing stared at me. It was sizing me up. I could see it making a mental decision in its head to not reveal itself even more, because it wasn't safe. The creature, after staring at me for what felt like forever, but probably only a few seconds, eventually walked a short distance away, back in the dark alley where it became before disappearing. I called 911 shortly after and told the police dispatch what I saw. They did take a report down, but never said anything. The officer seemed genuinely concerned for me, but in the end, I don't know if he took it seriously. Anyway, I thought I would share my experience with you. High up in the Sierra Nevada mountains, I was with my climbing partner and this was one of the most intense mountain climbing experiences I've ever done, 
aside from this encounter. My partner was sitting on top of a large pile of rocks, pulled out his canteen of water, and took five. That's when over the rocks appeared these creatures. Monsters, I would rather say, because of how frightening they all looked. Three of them, of large size. About eight to ten feet tall. Dark scales all over their body from head to toe. Lighter green on the front of their torso and body. Darker green on the back. They had these spines protruding from their backs that went all the way up their necks. Their faces were very reptilish, but very humanoid. They had large yellow reptilian eyes with slits and mouths full of little knives for teeth. Each one were carrying a dead deer in one hand, dragging them by the neck. As they noticed us, they immediately began stepping over the rocks, and they dropped their kill and began charging us. Because of their large size, their stride was enormous, and they reached us in such little time. Next to us, the pile of small rocks we were on was this tiny drop-off, maybe 20 feet of that. My partner and I both jumped out from it and landed onto heavy brush, breaking our fall. These things continued to charge us so fast that we didn't even think. The fear that came over us drove us to jump off this tiny drop-off, and when we landed, yes, it hurt like a mother. We just pulled ourselves up and ran down the way we came. I've never seen creatures like that before in my life, and it terrified us to our cores. The last few days I brought this incident back up with my old hiking partner, and he remembers it well. We're very careful now about where we go hiking. Had that drop off been closer to 50 feet, I think we would have been reptile food by now. This was back in 2008, when I was only 12 years old. I'm 24 now. What happened to me has left me with severe PTSD due to what I saw that day. Even now, it's hard for me to talk about, actually, and to write this out to you is tough. My family has a large creek, which they still own, that runs to the backside of their property, down in this little ravine. It actually feeds from one of the main rivers around here that flows through the area, so you have to be careful with powerful currents pulling you under. Not so much the creek, but as you get closer to where the river feeds into the creek, it can actually be really easy to slip and fall. I was swimming back here this day because it was a hot day in August and the temp outside was probably 102, I'm guessing. Where I'm at in the creek, I'm probably about thigh deep and I had just come out of the water from submerging myself as much as I could, trying to cool down my core. The water was cold since the river was mountain runoff water. I heard a noise, and that's when my heart dropped into my body. Coming down the creek, walking in my direction, looking right at me, was this beast, a monster, some sort of creature. It was large, with a slender body, and it was arched over slightly. It looked like a cross between a snake and Smeagol from Lord of the Rings, and had huge, over-exaggerated canine fangs kind of like how a snake does. It was jet black and covered in what appeared to be scales. The fangs were comparable to that of a saber-toothed tiger. They were exaggerated and extremely large and long. I had a very strong feeling of death and I knew my time was up in that moment. The second I made eye contact with this creature, it reached its hands out to me as it kept walking in my direction. Not like it was reaching out its hand to help, but to try and get me. It had long, sharp black claws at the end of each of its fingers. I screamed so loud I probably blew out a lung, and I ran out of that creek, tripped on a large rock, and fractured part of my leg from the impact. I had so much adrenaline pumping through me though, I didn't notice right away, and this creature continued to pursue me and chased me out of the ravine and backwoods. It's weird because I felt like it was strong and fast enough that it could have gotten me if it really wanted to, but it did keep a short distance between us, like it was just there to terrorize me and chase me out. This is still really hard for me to talk about, so I'm sorry if I'm leaving out details or not making sense, but that's what happened to me. 
I ran back to my house crying. My legs swollen, and I needed medical attention. I told my mom what happened, and she called 911. My leg got treated, and my dad thought it was a bear that was chasing me, and he goes back there with a rifle, but comes back about a half hour later, saying he didn't see anything like what I described. I didn't care if he or my mother believed me or not. It's a trauma that I'll have to live through now, and I still have frequent reoccurring nightmares. Several years ago, I was on my way home from work in the financial district of Lower Manhattan. I worked in an office building, literally a block away from Wall Street. This was late 2011, around the time of those Occupy Wall Street protests in the park. The streets were packed with people wearing backpacks and headphones, carrying signs and megaphones. It was pretty much impossible not to bump into people as you tried to navigate the narrow sidewalks. The hassle wasn't anything special to me. I had my earbuds in with music playing to drown out the noises during my commute, just like any other day. I do consider myself a New Yorker, through and through after all. However, in order to get to the subway and back home to Queens, I had to either go around or right through the park, which did get a bit annoying after a while. Still, Crowded streets are a part of our reality. Unfortunately, the same is true for the millions of homeless people taking refuge in the various nooks and crannies of the city. I am not a saint or anything, but I do try to at least drop a spare bit of change in their cups every so often. I wish I could say it was every time, but it's not. I want to help out when I can, but I'm embarrassed to say that I'm sometimes in such a rush that I don't even notice them there. I guess that makes me no different than the people who just breeze by the needy without giving the poor souls even a single glance. Sometimes, it's as if the homeless are an invisible element in our cities, subsisting on the scraps left behind by those more well-off. I think that may be the reason what happened that afternoon. Right in the midst of crowds of people was able to go unnoticed I don't think anyone but me realized or even cared about what was happening. The park was too crowded for me to walk through. Instead of trying to fight my way across to the subway, I decided to circle around and try a different stop in a quieter area. To get there though, I cut inside to a side street with significantly less busy. The moment I set foot there, I was struck with a feeling of heaviness and dread that instantly plunged my previously decent mood into an abyss. I couldn't understand why or where it was coming from, so I pulled out my earbuds and turned my music off. I felt I needed my senses to be as sharp as possible for whatever danger I was sensing. As I tucked the earbuds away in my coat pocket, a pungent odor began to creep into my nose. It was the smell that hits you when you walk into a subway car that a homeless person has made their home. I looked ahead, toward the corner of one of the buildings to see a surprisingly young man torn up jeans and hoodie. He had wild black hair and long unkempt beard. He rocked back and forth with a look of utter hopelessness etched into his face. He clutched a small cardboard sign covered in writing. I picked out a section that read, Help please, army vet. Lost everything. Just need $40 to get back home. There were very few people walking down that particular street, but enough passing through that he would occasionally pop out from his corner with his arms outstretched holding the sign, begging for some acknowledgement. It was a sad sight to behold. I felt terrible knowing that I had nothing on me to spare, so I would inevitably end up being one of these people myself walking by him without seeming to care at all. Just as that thought crossed my mind, I saw an odd-looking man further down the road, walking toward the homeless guy. The strange man stopped and crouched down to the homeless one's level. After staring at him a moment, the stranger reached into his pocket and pulled out a large roll of cash, holding it out in front of him as if to offer it, but clearly holding back. It was a bizarre sight, 
especially in New York City, but at least I no longer felt guilty for being unable to help the poor guy. I wish things went as you would expect from that point on, but unfortunately, that's where things began to get weird. To be honest, I've been building this up a long preamble, because every time I think back to this event, a sharp chill runs down my spine, and I swear, my eyes, they tear up. So, as I continue to walk toward the pair, I realize that everything, like the world around me, began to slow down somehow. The loud noises of the city streets faded into a soup of auditory blur, every sound muffled as if I was holding my hands over my ears and head underwater. As this was happening, I realized I was staring at the strange man holding the wad of cash. I noticed how ordinary he was. Everything about him was plain. He dressed like any other white collar worker. A simple or even slightly ugly brown suit hung loosely on his slender frame. He wore a tie and dress shoes and carried a generic leather briefcase. He also had a matching brown hat on his head, angled to hide the top half of his face. Looking back, I wish that was all I had seen. As I slowly made my way closer to them, the stranger lifted his hat to meet the confused gaze of the homeless man. That's when I stopped dead in my tracks. The formerly bland appearance of the man became clear to me, and I noticed two haunting features. His skin was bizarre, ash and white. Not paper white, but not gray either. His eyes? They were a deeper black than I could describe. I tried my best to rationalize what I was seeing. A guy wearing black contacts in a business suit would be a little weird, but I'm sure it wouldn't be the first time someone made those particular fashion choices out here. I can tell you this though, a regular guy dressed that way would not be enough to stop a New York in their tracks like it did me. It was more than the look of him. It was the feeling I got from it. It was like being punched in the chest. As a child, I dealt with frequent asthma attacks, and as an adult, I've had more than my share of panic attacks. But this was something else entirely. Much worse. A heavy, nauseating feeling that was born in the pit of my stomach crawled up to my chest before nesting in my throat. The air had become solid around me as I stood there, frozen. I could see in my peripheral vision that other people were still walking through the side street, although they moved in slow motion. After a few moments, the strange man and the homeless man's voice seemed to emerge from the muffled white noise of the rest of the city. Their voices slowly became clear and more clear. I missed a lot of what was being said, but certain words stood out. I don't want to die. The word shuddered from the homeless man's mouth as he reached for the money. His eyes were fixed on the roll of cash, yet steeped in hesitation and fear. The stranger smiled at him, and I swear to you, Mr. X, something about that smile made me want to scream. It was that moment I realized I couldn't scream, even if I had wanted to. I could do nothing but stand there helplessly, my feet nailed to the concrete sidewalk as the scene played out just a few yards in front of me. The stranger's response was chilling. Oh, well, you're gonna die either way, Robbie. Judging by the man's reaction, that must have been his name. At the mention of his name, Robbie sat straight up with a look of slack-jawed amazement tinged with horror. Side note, going forward, I'll refer to the man in the brown suit as Brown. This will be important in just a few minutes. So, before Robbie could say anything, Brown lifted his hand as if to get an important presentation and spoke again. His voice was just so wrong. I can only describe it as oily, gravelly and wet, like someone trying to talk through a mouthful of phlegm. If you think the description sounds gross, just imagine how foul it made me feel hearing it. This is what he said. Question is, do you want to die happy and comfortable, wanting nothing? Or here in this alley, 
where no one will ever notice you until you've been rotting a while. I still don't know how that scream didn't fly to my mouth after what happened next. If I could have moved at all, I might have jumped right out of my skin. A third voice chimed in before a corresponding figure stepped into my view. Another strange man, nearly identical to Brown, except taller and somehow even thinner, wearing a gray suit. I'll call this one gray for the sake of organization. Gray held a lit cigarette, stared down at Robbie with a tired look. Take the money, Robert. We have things to do. Robbie nodded with a re-signed expression as he took the cash. He gasped as he clawed at the bills, unfurling the surprising amount. This is so much, he exclaimed. I couldn't make out what was said next. I saw Brown stand up next to Gray, followed by Robbie standing and gathering his few possessions from the ground before thanking the two strange men and briskly walking toward me. He brushed past me in a hurry, thanking God over and over again, crying. I still could not move. I was stuck there as the two strangers' gaze fell onto me when Robbie was out of sight. The two sets of pitch black eyes staring at me gave me the distinct feeling of being watched by something not human. Their mouths had moved as if speaking to each other, but I couldn't make it out. The volume of the white noise around me was going crazy, up and down. It was disorientating. Eventually, I could hear a few bits of their conversation, but the language was unlike anything I've ever heard. Now think about this. I speak fluent Spanish and understand bits of many other languages, Italian, French, a little Japanese, Arabic, and even some Yiddish. You tend to pick up little things here and there living in New York City. I can certainly place a language roughly when I hear it. The strangers were speaking, it was just unlike anything I'd ever encountered. The sounds they were making weren't even sounds that people made. It actually caused me physical pain in my ears when I really began to hear it. Like when your ears pop on an airplane. The feeling when you know there's pressure there, but you can't get it out. So it stings. The pain got so bad that I wanted to vomit. Brown snarled the word at his friend in the same wet voice. Ah, uh, English. Gray made a bizarre clicking noise smiling the same horrific smile Brown did earlier. That far gone, huh? It'll be fine, Brown responded. Yeah, then why'd you lie? What Brown said next still keeps me up some nights, even all these years later. He rolled his shoulders back and grunted. Does it matter? I'll be wearing that stupid chimp by the next moon, followed by a clicking noise. My eyes began to welt with tears as I tried desperately to look away. I was still paralyzed. Slowly, the world began to creak back toward normal speed again. Mr. X, I'm telling you, I'm trying so or not to cry as I sit here typing this, just like the plight of Robbie or any other homeless man. No one bothered to even look at me as I stood there in terror. People were there, moving slower than normal at least from my perspective, but nobody stopped or noticed that I was in trouble. Gray looked directly at me. My head started swimming, and I immediately felt dizzy. My vision blurred and I lost focus on all except one thing, Gray's voice. Well now, look what this one can do. Cute. Suddenly, Brown stepped forward from the blur in my eyes. His black face sneered it from me just inches away. Whatever. A chimp's a chimp. They're all the same. Hey, leave now. He snarled again, and I felt it in my bones. Keep walking. I wish I could tell you what happened next, but the next thing I knew, I was standing on the sidewalk all the way up at Columbus Circle in Midtown almost a half hour's walk north of where I was. A man I didn't know was holding my shoulders as random people passed by with concerned looks on their faces. 
When things came back into focus, I could finally hear the man's voice. You all right, son? He asked with a trembling voice. Damn near walked into traffic, man. You okay? Somebody said I must be on drugs that they yelled out as they scooted by. I told the man I was okay, as tears began to run freely down my face. I apologized and fled the scene, rushing over to the escalator to a train, having no idea how I got so far uptown. By the time I got home, I realized I wouldn't be able to tell anybody, not even my wife. She would definitely think I was losing my mind. I haven't seen those strange men, or whatever they were, since that day. Thank God for that. Over the years, I've done research into the paranormal to try and identify what they may have been, but I haven't found anything with their description or actions. I heard of black eye kids and the vibes people seem to get from them that are similar to how I felt with brown and gray, but the situation was different. These were grown, at least middle-aged men, I think. I don't know what I saw. Were they aliens? It still messes with me. I've been to therapy about this and have tried to rationalize, but no luck. Whatever the case is, I'm not sure. I can hopefully go back to my daily life. Without thinking about the incident, whenever I allow myself to reflect back on it, it just shakes me up. And I'm not immune to late nights of insomnia for fear of nightmares. So, I still question my own sanity every so often. Was this real? Did I really have an encounter with half-human hybrid aliens? I grew up around many Navajo and Apache natives who have shared with me many ancient tales and warnings not to travel into certain blacklisted regions in the deserts for what evil lurks there. People who started villages and sects of life were destroyed by this evil. The same evil that is said to come from deep within the Sonoran Desert has made its way far north to where we thrive and inhabit. I myself am half native and try and embrace my culture and belief system as much as I can. There is truth to the wisdom that is spoken to me through my people and friends. I have a deep love for this nation and do not wish to see it tarnished by the black magic of those evil doers that wish to wreak havoc upon it. The peace that is currently being upheld today is only because of certain protections and wards against those of the darkness, the great spirit. I know your channel is all about bringing alertness to these creatures that exist and practice evil out in the world so that they can grow in their power and prey upon the weak but I can share this information with you and in hopes that you can share it on your channel and then maybe more people will become aware of what truly exists out there and to stay away from. The more victims these creatures of evil claim, the more power they obtain, the more reign they have. You have spoken much about the shapeshifters of my land that practice magic and wear the skins of coyotes and other kills, but there is a far more powerful and smaller sect of shapeshifters that lie beneath the ground in caverns and underneath the deserts. The more power they obtain, the more their influence reigns in my region, the Navajo Nation, and even further north. These shapeshifters take the form of large desert reptilian serpents, serpent beings that devour dreary wanderers and tourists alive, or capture them to be taken back to have the life force sucked out of them. I have heard others call this same life force Andrinochrome. I believe that's the scientific name for it, but that's what these shapeshifters feed on. They come out at once the sun is set in the sky, to wander the deserts at night, seeking those that they can prey upon easily. They are said to inhabit the bowels underneath the sands. There are many caverns underneath the deserts that should be closed up and people should stay far away from. Several have already been turned into tourist attractions for those that enjoy underground caverns. This is very dangerous and potentially invoking the presence of these beings. 
I am still not clear whether this sect of shapeshifters is even humans, or something far more vile. Unlike the shapeshifters here, these entities possess far greater strength and can hide away much easier, revealing themselves only when they want to be revealed. They will even go as far as camouflaging themselves as a regular native, just to try and lure persons from nearby tribes away. I don't think it to be a coincidence that these shapeshifters are the only things to come out of the area of the desert. My people have talked about flying demons that also live beneath the desert sand. I personally believe these to be in alignment with these shapeshifters, or possibly even under their control to scout the area, looking for the next victim. I'm giving you this information because people who want to tour the area or just passing by need to be extremely aware and understand that driving through the area at night is incredibly dangerous. You need to be very careful, and you wouldn't believe me if I told you how many people go missing that are taken captive by these things, but are written off as lost to sex trafficking. It's horrendous. I'm just trying my best to keep my people safe by informing the uneducated. Please, it would mean the world to me if you could share this message. At least many who listen to it will take my warning and understand the true dangers that lie outside beneath the sands. My uncle, who is a Navajo Nation police respondent, came across a group of teenage girls huddled together on the morning hours of September 1st 2018, startled, crying, and frightened by something. They were far out in the desert, miles from the nearest road, and claimed to be driven there by what they described as a man who turned into a demon. The man was not like your typical skinwalker, and did not wear animal skins in religious garments. He dressed with a black clay covering his entire body and a single loincloth. And then, he changed into this demon, they said, with eyes so black they were almost white. This man, or demon, was intent on killing them, so it chased these girls far out in the middle of the night in the desert. It grabbed one of the girls, ripped a clump of her hair out, and she had a huge clump of hair missing. Blood had dried and ran down her scalp. One of the girls that was with them was reported missing and was actually never found, even after a thorough investigation had been in full effect. The four girls out of five claim this demon man took this girl and took her away. They have no clue to where he took her. The girls were questioned why they were there and what they were doing. The nearest road being only a few miles away, they were en route to going home after a party in the early morning hours when they got a flat. While trying to change the tire, they were approached by a fierce looking man who came out of the desert and threatened them with rape and violence, which led to him physically chasing them into the night where they ran for a long time, where they were eventually found huddled up together around this large rock. The slowest of the girls was the youngest at 14 and was the one that was grabbed and taken away. Stories like this happen all the time here on the reservation and it's kept very quiet so not often words get out. Encounters with beings like skinwalkers and evil spirits are far more common than just drunks and thieves. It's a dangerous world out here, and it's currently not welcome to visitors, even if they are of Navajo descent. My story takes place along the Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. I encountered a handful of strange creatures, or what I would like to call desert witches that can shapeshift into reptilian beings. I would later find out from an experienced Navajo men and women that this was indeed true, and of course my friend. At the time, I was with my ex-wife, who during the time was my current wife. For the story, I will call her Jamie. I also feel the need to point out though that even the canyon isn't quite on Navajo reservation. It does border, and many of the Navajo have experienced wandering through the same canyon. Their experiences, from what I've learned, are very grim, to say the least, or so what I've heard. They claim this to be the territory of shape-shifting witches, 
Not the same thing as a skinwalker, I'm told. On this day, we were the only few people on the trail, and nobody else was really around. The isolation being bittersweet, although I rather enjoyed the privacy, it made the situation so much more heightened. On this day, we made our way about a mile and a half down into the canyon before this strange lady was walking in our direction, muttering some strange things under her breath. We got a really weird feeling about her and kept away. She wore a strange veil over her face and her clothes seemed out of place. I can't quite place the description that would accurately describe to you what she had, but it reminded me of Middle Eastern clothing. We soon forgot about her and continued walking past and continued on. Shortly after, we began to hear strange sounds behind us and around us. My wife Jamie at the time began to express to me that she felt uncomfortable, like she was being watched. I told her to look around that there's nobody out here. I didn't hear the sounds, only she did. She still couldn't budge the feeling though, and we soon found an area to sit down at, to take a break, and have some water, and collect ourselves. We were in conversation for only a couple of minutes before we began to hear, both of us, what I would describe as religious chanting. It seemed to be coming from all around us and nowhere at the same time. Behind us, around us, above us and below us. I thought we were hallucinating, but it kept getting louder and louder. Jamie and I can both hear it as we're both frantically looking around, trying to find the source of this noise when this chanting starts to evolve into something much more disturbing. Growls and roars. The chanting grew and grew in volume, and then began to fade in sounds as the growls and roars took over. And then there was no more chanting, just roaring and growling. It sounded close by, but also far away. With the canyon structure and the rocks, I know the sounds can reverberate and play tricks on your ears, making you think there is something much closer than it actually is. Now, there was no more chanting, but it sounded like there were 20 lions trapped behind a rock or something, and it was seriously giving both of us the creeps. I didn't even have to motion to Jamie for us to get out of there before we ditched. Later on that day, after we had left, I told a close friend of mine what had happened who happens to be full-blooded Navajo and knows the area around the reservation in the canyon and multiple other areas very well. He seemed scared when I told him what happened and told me that I had apparently witnessed a shape-shifting ceremony, or at least heard it. This is what he described to me, that they were shape-shifting witches that go down into the canyon and they usually sacrifice humans or animals and drink the blood and turn into these creatures. He did not exactly specify if there needed to be a sacrifice for them to shapeshift, but he did make it clear that they would get together and have some sort of ritual ceremony and turn into creatures. That would explain the loud roaring I heard and growls. It was terrifying, even if his story that he told me did seem far-fetched. It matched up with everything we heard, which is terrifying. It would also explain the religious chanting that I heard. It very well reminded me of something you would hear out of the occult, or something along those lines in just another language. This can be marked as easily one of the scariest experiences I've ever had in my life, but I just can't explain what it is. This happened when I was 14. For a little bit of background, this takes place at my grandparents' house. They live in Virginia, in a forest by a large river, in a loose community. There are about three roads in the community, one of which has about 15 houses, a short road that leads to some wetlands that smell terrible, and then there's a long road that leads down to the river that has three large houses. That's the road that my grandmother lives on. Her house is by the water. On the other side of the house, across the gravel road, is her garage. The garage is about 100 to 200 feet back from the road and looks more like a large house rather than a garage. It is nestled against the tree line of the forest. When this happened, I was with my siblings along with my cousins. 
so it was dark out, and someone had the amazing idea of playing Manhunt. The boundaries were set to the land which my grandparents own, which included the garage. One of my cousins and I decided it would be best to stick together so we could split up if somebody found us. We crawled into some bushes by the road and waited. Not long after we settled down, I started to get a feeling. It was very soft at first, just a tugging sensation in the back of my mind. Something was off. I slowly started to pay more and more attention to the noises around me. Everything sounded normal. By normal, I mean the cicadas were buzzing so loudly I could hear anything else. Still, there was the feeling that I needed to move. At this point, I suggested we were too close to the road and maybe we should change spots. We crawled out from the bushes and moved across the gravel road, making a wide arc around the garage just to prevent the motion lights from going off and showing my sister, who was hunting us, where we were. When I stepped out into the field that the garage is on the other side of, I was aware of something. I couldn't tell what it was, but I had something's attention. It wasn't the feeling of being watched, but more like knowing that something was out there, and it knew I was here but it didn't know where I was exactly yet. I downplayed it and thought it might have just been my brother, as he likes to sneak up on people. Besides, me and my cousin often get feelings that things are watching us, and if I brought this up, she would only freak out. So, my cousin and I head for the tree line next to the garage. Now, the ground behind the tree line slopes down suddenly at what I would say is a steep angle for about three feet before flattening out. Kinda like if you Google forest roads and look at how just off the sides of the ground slopes down suddenly. We laid on our stomachs and watched the road from our new hiding spot just inside the forest. I noticed after a minute that things were quieter. I looked back for a second and just kinda was listening to my gut for a minute. My gut was practically screaming at me to get up and run. I knew that something was watching me I decided to just lay perfectly still and observe my surroundings closely. It was dark and I could only see the barn in the field. I had no chance of seeing anything in the forest due to the leaves blocking most of the moonlight. It seemed very quiet and very wrong. I noticed the cicadas had stopped buzzing and I couldn't even hear the crickets. It got so quiet that I heard ringing in my ears and the only noises I could hear was the light crunching of leaves under my cousin's stomach as she breathed. By this point, she was looking around, clearly frightened. When I slowly looked up at her, I could tell she had the same feeling of dread, the feeling that something was waiting, and it was about to do something. When she opened her mouth to say something, we both heard a sudden crackling noise behind us, and both of us decided we did not want to die. I have never ran faster in my life. The motion lights from the garage turned on, and I could see the shadows of something behind us. We ran to where our grandparents' driveway starts, as it was much brighter. I looked back to see if my cousin was behind me, and I almost tripped over my own feet. I could only see its silhouette, it was, at my guess, seven, maybe eight feet tall. Its arms were too long, and its chest was thicker than it should be. Its head was human, but also not human. The shape of it was all wrong. It had two yellow eyes that locked onto my frozen figure. It turned its head slightly and watched me while I stared at it. My cousin was not going to let me stand there and die, so she started pulling me back to the house, screaming at me. The thing across the street then turned its head to the side, as if watching for a car to come down the gravel road. It looked like its face had skin but not the area around its lips or teeth. Think of anywhere that you could bite your own cheek or lips, and the skin and flesh around there was just gone. Its teeth were something else. One of the things that was wrong with it was its face was simply too big. Its teeth were huge, and they stuck out a bit from its face. I got the feeling it was showing me this to taunt me, as if to say, want to stick around and find out more? No, I did not and after figuring out the whole big sharp teeth thing, I was happy to run to the porch and hide with my cousin. We hid there for half an hour. We only came out after somebody suggested that maybe we hid across the street and I was not okay with any of my family members 
possibly running into that thing again. While my cousin and I were hiding, we talked about how no one would believe us, and how if somebody did believe us, then it would be our grandmother, who would probably then try and find it. Both of us agreed just to not to tell our family. When it's dark at my grandma's house, my cousin no longer goes outside and stays in. I don't stray far from the light of the house and don't go near any bushes. When I'm inside, I make sure all the windows are shut and locked. If I'm feeling brave, I'll sit at the end of the pier with my feet in the water looking back at the house, never with my back to the shore. While I'm outside and sometimes when I stand near windows with the curtains and shades open, I get the feeling it's watching me in the dark, wherever it lurks. I'm curious as to what this was. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a skinwalker because Virginia isn't exactly close to any Navajo reservations, but at the same time, I don't exactly know. So I've always wanted to share this story. I've only told a few people, just because I knew nobody would probably believe me. And to be honest, it took a few years for me to come to terms with what I saw, but I still stand by it. When I was 19, I'm 31 now, I lost my job at a Coca-Cola plant in New Mexico, born and lived till I was 24. My older brother asked if I would be interested in working at the mines in Arizona. He had been there for a month already with a friend, and they lived in an RV park in Clifton, Arizona, and mine wasn't far out from where they lived. I lived at the chance to get out and get out of my boring town, and in about three weeks, I had myself a job. I would stay with my brother and his friend in the RV on weekends, and we would drive back to visit family, etc. The RV park we stayed at was actually pretty interesting. On one side, there was like a wall where on the bottom was like a gorge, where it would venture off into streams through the town, and on the other, a huge cliff. At night, the way the moon hit it looked like something out of a painting. The courtyard was huge. All the RVs wrapped around it. Where we were parked to get to the showers and rec room was just a straight 200 feet walk, majority through the big courtyard. The thing that did suck there was the javelinas. Sometimes after taking a shower, you would have to haul your butt back to the RV or wait in the rec room for them to leave outside. They would sometimes be wandering in the park. I remember one time my brother and friend thought it would be funny to chase a javelina family off with bats. It was pretty hilarious, until they got chased back. So, one night after dinner, I decided to go outside and listen to some music. I remember we had a picnic type bench that faced towards the courtyard. I'm sitting there with my headphones in, bumping some music, when I saw something come into the courtyard. I thought it was a cat at first, moved like one, but the body was longer. Then I saw the longer ears and thought maybe it's a coyote or a dog. I'm watching it kind of move through the area, but it was already dark, so I couldn't see it perfectly. My headphones are still blaring at this point. I decide to get up off the bench and get its attention. I do that thing where you click your mouth to get a dog's attention, and I see the ears go up when it heard me. I'm kind of standing by the RV door and the table, and I see the thing start to come towards me, but I see it's crouching but moving quickly. I'll never forget that. There I am smacking my tongue at it like an idiot, and this thing is moving like a snake. It got about maybe 80 feet before all of a sudden, it must have heard something in the distance because it stopped and its head kind of cocked and decided to run off towards the cliff. Here's the thing I'll never ever forget. When it ran off, it stood up. It looked like a very skinny boy had been wearing a fur coat when it ran, because the skin was dangling, but still attached to its head. It was so fast and strange, I just sort of stood there, confused. I really had to just stand there and let my brain process or try to process what I saw. I told my brother and his friend. Of course, they didn't believe me. My brother said it's probably somebody's dog, but that still didn't explain the boy figure. I told my mother, and she's seen some crazy stuff in her time, but nothing like what I told her. I never saw anything like that at the RV park again. Still saw the javelinas wandering about, but that was it. 
I worked for another few weeks, but got laid off and went back to see my parents. I honestly don't know too much about skinwalkers, but I know I saw something that wasn't in the realm of normal. I used to live out in the country, up north in Canada, far out in the sticks. You had to bike or drive to go anywhere, aside from a small little taco stand. At night, it would get pretty dark too. With my mother and stepdad, we had a few small dogs and a cat. I was often left in charge of all of them. I was kind of resentful for all the extra work, on top of my schooling and homework but I love the animals, so I couldn't blame them too much unless they made a huge mess. Then I'd be pretty ticked. But that's not the entirety of why this is relevant. What is, is that I would routinely take them out all before going to bed. I would go to bed very, very late at night, like any 14 year old with such lax parenting. My dogs would usually stay in the front yard, which is a very vast acreage of flat land with a tiny ditch. It was easy to see the small dogs and call them back in. Sometimes, the one dog would wander. My mother's terrier had a bit of a rebellious side to her, but it wasn't her who took off this night. It was the Cocker Spaniel. She was a protective and watchful eye, while the others were mostly divas. Frustrated, I ran after her around to the back of the house which is a steep slope toward a waterbed that is an offshoot of the Red River. What I saw slowly sprawling across the slope coming in our direction still gives me the chills. These things were about chest height to me and 20 feet away. Very grotesque looking, like they were covered in rotting dead flesh and tight skin with their bones exposed, but on all fours, with long legs that were longer in the back. They turned their almost rotting faces to look over at us at the top of the slope. Their eyes were large and glowed in the faint back porch lights like big white marbles. Luckily, my dog had frozen at the top with me, her hackles raised like a hyena. The creatures were still walking and pacing around, making sure to keep an eye on us like we were a newly discovered threat. I grabbed the dog by crouching quickly, frightened we'd be attacked, and bolted around to the side of the house to the front again, calling for the others to quickly come inside. The other two dogs were already sitting at the door, waiting for us. I guess they figured it was too chilly for them to stay out for so long, but truthfully, my out of shape self was boiling from the adrenaline. I refused to take them out after dark after that, which unfortunately, resulted in plenty of messes I had to clean up. I would occasionally see these strange things, these weird creatures wandering outside of our house after that. It gave me the creeps. They'd only look up at my house if I had the lights on and was obviously moving in a clear view. Another night I woke up, radio flashing 3 a.m. or something around that. I wasn't sure why I woke up at that time until I realized that I was not alone. I sleep in the basement at the time, my window overlooking the backyard, but only slightly. It was located under the back porch, which was able to be walked under if you simply stopped a bit. One of those things, which what appeared to be a rotting flesh skull looking face with dead sunken in eyes looked through in my window. I froze. I'm not even sure if I moved at all after waking up. It pressed its disgusting head against the glass for a brief moment and snorted real loud. I got the feeling it was scanning the darkness for someone, me. After a minute, it pulled its head back and resumed the direction it was originally walking in. To this day, I have no idea what they were. They looked very skinny and emaciated and appeared to have what I would describe as rotting flesh all over their bodies. It was putrid looking they acted and moved very strangely as well, and walked on all fours, sometimes alternating to just two legs. They had really long legs and arms. I didn't see any claws or any other distinctive features. 
The only thing I could find when looking up any sort of myth was cryptids like the Wendigo or Skinwalker. But a Skinwalker is usually only a Navajo native thing, and up here, it's just not very likely. I don't know what a Wendigo looks like, although I know they're supposed to be a cannibalistic creature. I just don't know if they're depicted as looking like they have rotting flesh, aside from the simple distance making it hard to discern their faces. They stuck around long enough for me to get a really good look at them and their form. So what was I seeing out there? Back during the summer of 2015, I had the most terrifying experience of my life. I've always been a rabid outdoorsman and have always been obsessed with camping. Really, anything involving nature, actually. I would go out camping with a couple of very close friends of mine who were also part native and knew a lot about the wild around them. It was very helpful in many situations, actually. We had gone hiking on all sorts of different trails, land and areas, even areas deep within my friend's reservation where most people don't go and have the proper permission to go out to. That's what makes the Reslan so great. It's generally uncharted because many of the natives that live on it themselves don't bother to go out far into it. Here, the area was thick with wild game, like deer, black bear, and even cougars. On several occasions, we had gone far out into the wilderness on his tribe's land for miles, sometimes going as much as we could go in one day, just to see how far we can make it. The forest was always so full of life, especially out here, where normal white men like myself never get the opportunity to venture into. They held this place sacred and would even hold off hunting it unless they absolutely needed to. Usually, every trip it would just be me and a couple of his family members that I was also close with. But the one time I went with him, I noticed something very eerie. We were exploring an area that we never had gone through before a totally uncharted area for both of us, but we were confident. We were probably about four plus hours into a long hike, and over the whole day, the forest had gone completely silent. I know we have cougars around, but generally, this isn't the case with a cougar, with the woods being silent. I waited as quietly as possible and surveyed my surroundings meticulously. The sun was still bright in the sky, and burning hot as ever on this warm summer day. It was weird to have so much light, so much daylight, and so little sound. That is when a very creepy thing happened. I heard my name being called out close by. It didn't sound normal though. It sounded weird. It sounded like somebody trying to mimic my native friend who was right next to me at the time. And the voice sounded kind of distorted. It called out my name telling me to come here. My friend looks at me, and he's sweating bullets now. He says something in his native tongue, and urges me that we needed to leave now. He kept telling me to not respond to it, no matter what it says, and we begin to turn back the way we come. Whatever the thing had called out to me was close by in the woods, and now it was following us closely as we made our way back. It was just beyond my line of sight, my friend was starting to become incredibly nervous and kept whispering to himself in his own language. I think it was a prayer. I kept asking him what's going on, what's calling my name, but he wouldn't respond directly. He just kept saying that he'll explain later, we just need to get to a safe spot. This went on for a couple more miles until we passed through a large creek that this thing did not pass through, but continued to call out through me through the woods. It never revealed itself, whatever it was. There were these strange wooden structures, I guess if you wanted to call them structures. They were hanging from the trees, and I was told those are border markers. Border markers of the Wendigo. We hadn't seen them before because, when we crossed the creek earlier, it was an entirely different area of the creek, and the area that we didn't have the markers so we didn't realize what laid ahead of us. We made it safely through the other side and within no time actually, made it back to where he was staying, just a few more hours of hiking. So maybe we were definitely more than four hours out. Once we got back, I could get him to thoroughly calm down and relax, 
He told me that what had happened was we came upon a Wendigo's territory in the woods. He should have known by the feel of the energy around us, but chose to ignore it because he thought his gut was misleading us. Wendigos are cannibalistic creatures that lure you in and devour you. Many have been lost to these creatures, even more during the night. They can read your thoughts and mimic those who are close to you in order to lure you in, trap you where they can get you. Had we gone just a little further into the woods, it would have gotten us. He had me freaked out by telling me all this stuff. His brothers and family confirmed this to be true with me right there and told us it's very dangerous to be in that area of woods. There is a reason that many of their people will not venture out into these places because, plain and simple, that's Wendigo territory. That is why his people and family only go out there hunting for food if they absolutely have to because they know there is such a large risk involved in going to these places. You know, thinking back on it, the utter silence of the woods was incredibly disturbing to me, at least in this context. I've been in those situations before, where a mother bear was around with small cubs, but never like that. And I don't recall the woods going silent like they did there. You could hear a pencil drop, it was so quiet. To this day, when to go or not, I can't be 100% certain of what I encountered. Could it have only been a bear? Or maybe something else, and my friends were overreacting? Possibly. But if that's true, then what was calling out my name in his distorted voice? And why was it following us so closely the entire way back to the creek, where there is supposed territory markers? It just didn't make any sense. That was one of the last times I went super far into the deep woods, and probably won't be going back anytime soon.